Wait, how does this work? You just press the button. This one? No, not that one. <laughs> You're listening to Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to all things nuclear. I'm joined now by Tom Kalina, Director of Policy. Joe Cerincioni, President of the Plowshares Fund. Philip Yoon, the Executive Director of the Plowshares Fund. Development Director from Plowshares Fund, Elizabeth Warner. And here's your host, Joe Cerincioni. Thank you, and welcome to Press the Button, a podcast unlike anything you've heard before. We're going to begin each episode with early warning, a roundup of the latest news on national security and nuclear policy, things that we're following and we think you should too. We'll then do an interview segment with people who are making the news. Today, you'll have the chance to listen to Dr. Carol Cohn, one of the leaders on gender and national security issues. She's going to guide us through how radioactive masculinity is distorting our nuclear policy. And we'll also do special segments like today's In the Silo, a behind-the-scenes look at how the policy is made. Today, we're going to follow the scientists and officials who are setting the doomsday clock of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. We'll track them as they make the rounds on Capitol Hill and talk with leading members of Congress. And we're going to do all this in 30 minutes. The clock is ticking. Let's go. And now, early warning. Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. A seven-minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Everything seems impossible till it happens. Everyone would be affected by a nuclear war. Our government is planning to spend trillions of dollars to develop new nuclear weapons that we don't need. You can't win a nuclear war. We are all experts on nuclear weapons because we are all going to be affected by those nuclear weapons. And welcome to Early Warning. Uh, every week we will tell you the stories we're watching and we think you should be paying attention to in this field, and we're going to do it in under seven minutes. Seven minutes is the maximum amount of time the President of the United States has to decide, upon notice of an enemy nuclear attack in the United States, whether he will respond, even though he may not know whether that's a false alarm or not. So if he can make that decision in seven minutes, we can certainly give you the news in that time. So, And helping me do that here in our glass-enclosed Washington, D.C. headquarters is Catherine Kilo, our Roger Hale fellow specializing on uh, Korean issues, and Michelle Dover, our program director in charge of all the grants that Plowshares Fund makes. So, Michelle, what stories are you watching? Well, the one I want to start with is the letter that Senator Chris Van Hollen led on with 23 other senators mm -hmm. urging President Trump to extend uh, the new strategic arms reduction treaty, we call it New START, with Russia for another five years. That's now nine years old. Obama and uh, Med Medvedev signed it uh, nine years ago. And it's going to expire in 2021. There isn't enough time at this point to, re to negotiate a new treaty. Um, these things are a lot harder to negotiate than closing on a house. Yeah, I and saw so Chris Van Hollen uh, the time. yesterday at the Arms Control Association annual dinner, and he was on fire about this. He was really worked up. He's done a great job leading his senators. And so what do they want the president to do? Um, they want a five-year extension in to give time to start new negotiations, but at the same time ensure that there is an operating bilateral treaty and between this, the U.S. and Russia. Would this Russia. require Senate approval? No. All it takes is the stroke of a pen. Great. I, I read their letter, and they were quite powerful on this. They said, quote, arms control is not an end in itself. It is a tool for containing the military capabilities of our adversaries and safeguarding the national security interest of the United States and our allies. Good for them. Okay, Catherine, what are you looking at? Well, I have two new developments on North Korea. First, it looks like South Korean President Moon Jae-in's recent visit to Washington has paid off. Mm. Uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un made uh, remarks the other day that he's uh, essentially left the door open for another meeting with President Trump. Mm -hmm. This would be a third summit. But he has set a hard deadline for action from the U.S., and that's by the end of this year. 
the problem is that both sides are demanding that the other take the first big uh, step. I, there's a big gap between the two sides at yeah. this point. I mean, it, 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 cl it was clear at the Hanoi summit and afterwards that Kim uh, is willing to to give up part of his nuclear complex in exchange for relaxation of part of the U.S. sanctions. But Trump, it seems, is now falling under the spell of Bolton, uh, John, John Bolton, the National Security Advisor, and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who insist on an all-up-front deal that Kim has to give up his chemicals, nuclear, his biological, his missiles, and then maybe we'll consider sanction relief. How are they going to bridge that gap? Well, that leads me to my second news story, okay. <laughs> which is that the Kremlin has actually confirmed that plans are underway for a summit between President Putin and Kim Jong-un. Huh. This would be their first uh, meeting, but Putin's been around long enough that he's actually met with Kim Jong-un's father, Kim Jong-il, uh, oh, yeah. in 2000. Oh, in, yeah, in, in Korea, in North Korea. Yeah, in North Korea. He was, uh, he, I don't think a Soviet leader has ever gone to North Korea. Was he the first Russian leader to do this? He was. Huh. So uh, we'll we'll see how, how those developments shake so out. So we'll see if the Russia card can convince Trump to make a deal. Michelle, what else you got for us? Uh, well, you know, U.S. Iran is a perennial on my radar. So I don't know if you saw, you I'm sure saw the story about how State Department has now designated the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. Of course. A foreign terrorist organization. And, yeah, as well. What does yeah, this they, mean? Yeah, they just declared 11 million Iranians to be terrorists. First time the United States has ever designated a military component of another country as a terrorist organization. And that's the key to this story, because, you know, in in, in asking, like, well, what does this mean in the day-to-day -day and sanctions? Mm -hmm. Like, that's the wrong question. The question is, how does this fit in the broader arc of what the Trump administration is trying to do with Iran? And um, from where I'm sitting, it's yeah. looking like they're laying the groundwork for military confrontation. Yeah. Yeah, we're seeing stories pop up about this. A lot of the experts in the groups we work with are, are warning about this. And I think the other, you know, and as well, these questions of what Congress's role is, does the Trump administration right. actually have the authority? Right, and this was so troubling about, uh, about Pompeo's testimony to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee last week. Senator Rand Paul, Republican, asked him, D does, does the authorization for the use of military force that we passed after 9-11, in Pompeo's view, did that give him authority to make military strikes on Iran? Clearly giving the secretary a chance to say no, it doesn't, but he didn't say no. He didn't say yes. He said, well, we'll see. We're looking at that. I'll leave that to the lawyers. And that's one of the, st the, the stories that made people concerned that this is a step-by-step -step process towards what would be the, uh, a war in the Middle East unlike anything we've seen so far. Catherine, what else? Well, lastly, I want to highlight that uh, nuclear weapons is emerging as an important issue for a lot of presidential candidates. Hmm. Just last night, I was watching Senator Sanders' town hall on uh, Fox News, and he remarked that uh, we should do everything we can to rid this world of nuclear weapons. I saw that. He didn't talk much about national security. In fact, none of the candidates have talked much about national security, but when they do, they seem to be highlighting uh, nuclear. I was in... Uh, Colorado, the University of Colorado over the weekend, and I saw Senator Amy Klobuchar give a very powerful town hall there, and she came out in favor of re-entering the anti-nuclear agreement with Iran. She pledged that as president she would rejoin not just the climate accord, the Paris climate accord, but also the Iran nuclear deal. It was a big applause line. So we're seeing this start to come out as the candidates begin to stake out their national security uh, positions. And, you know, especially with the amount of anxiety that President Trump causes mm -hmm. in terms of um, you know, nuclear questions of war and peace, you know, it's something that I expect the other candidates are going to be taking positions on and is something I will be following closely. Uh-oh, time's up. Oh, it's man. seven so minutes. Do you, think, do you think he's launched? That is how long the president would have to decide. But we got to end <laughs> it here and get to the interview. Thank you very much, Michelle and Catherine. And here is Joe Serencioni's in-depth conversation with Dr. Carol Cohn. I'm here with Dr. Carol Cohn, who is the founding director of the Consortium on Gender, Security, and Human Rights, and an icon in the field. She has been writing and researching and working on these issues for over three decades. 
Many, many people have read her essays, and it's a privilege to have you. Thank you for joining us, Carol. Thank you so much. I'm going to start right in um, with uh, a summary paragraph you wrote in the new Plowshares Fund a report on uh, new vision for national security. You argue that many of our assumptions and beliefs about which security policies will be effective arise from a series of gendered ideas about how to most effectively exercise power, what it means to be strong, and what works to keep us secure. What do you mean by that? Uh, well, um, start out with gendered ideas rather than gendered people. Yes. Um, clearly, we live in a patriarchal society, and what that means is not only that we think that men are uh, better, more deserving of power, um, than women, but also that the qualities that we associate with masculinity are better, are more powerful. Um, so that, for example, um, we think that aggression is more effective than not acting. We think that um, being uh, dispassionate, quote, objective, uh, keeping emotions out of, mm -hmm. your, uh, out of your thinking is leads to better outcomes than actually letting yourself think about, for example, the people at the other end of what you're talking about doing and how they might feel or what might happen to them. So there are these series of assumptions that we have that we should be, um, what goes along with masculinity would be things like being really well defended, not letting anybody penetrate your boundaries, being able to use physical force, being willing to threaten to use physical force. Um, thinking that people only understand the language of force. Also thinking that vulnerability, for example, first of all, invites attack. Mm -hmm. And second of all, that vulnerability is something that you can and must strive to avoid. Mm -hmm. And I would argue, first of all, that um, something that uh, women can't avoid encountering in their lives, vulnerability is an inevitable part of the human condition. We can't actually avoid it. And that the effort to make yourself or your country be invulnerable actually leads you to more damage rather than protecting you. So it's, you know, it's really simple to figure, if you think about it in relation to a child, for example, if you try to keep your children completely invulnerable, yes. you'd not let them out on the street, right? You'd keep them locked up in a room someplace, and you'd do more damage to them than you do actually help them. If you think about what we've done to our country to try to keep it invulnerable, what have we done? We have created this massive military, which we have used around the world in ways that have gotten a lot of people around the world very angry at the United States. We have spent vast amounts of money on it that we then haven't spent on things like, oh, basic health care or um, doing anything about poverty in the country. And we also have created weapons, nuclear weapons, creating, first, well, first of all, creating the opportunity to wipe out most of life and civilization on the yes. planet as we know it. In an um, afternoon. In an afternoon, with a with a ten minute decision making time, yes. right, at the hands of one person who is has always been a him, who is himself actually a vulnerable, imperfect human being, who is going to when he is making that decision, among other things, not only be thinking about. Well, not thinking about <laughs> um, what happens at the other end of yes. those weapons, but actually thinking about how do I deal with being attacked? Oh, I've got so much to talk to you about. Okay. Um, so this is one. So in some ways, the idea of security itself is, is, is problematic and is gendered, mm -hmm. but, but it's also been hijacked to mean only military force. So the Department of Defense yes. used to be the Department of War. Now mm -hmm. it's the Department of Defense. That's what provides security, not health and human services, right? Right, absolutely. So that, that's your point. And when we think about how, well, the new budget is 
oh, I think the president wants $750 billion. And the Democrats, oh, the brave Democrats, are offering to $736 billion, <laughs> which is just an enormous amount of money. And right. this is all justified under security. And so when people talk about the Green Deal or Medicare for All or, or um, uh, health, other health issues, that's not security. That's right. your point here. Well, and that... In, that if we got up there and said, okay, listen, this isn't bringing us security, and actually what I think is that national security doesn't equate with human security, which is, is the assumption that we're implicitly yes. making, right? People won't be secure unless the nation is secure, which we define as having this massive military arsenal. If you get up there and you say, you know what? I don't think we need that size military budget. I think we should invest in health and daycare and human services people are going to accuse you of being what? Weak. Weak, soft, wimpish, Absolutely. feminine, right? You hear it all the time from Dems on it, the Hill. They don't, they're afraid of being seen as weak. Men and women feel this. Yes, exactly. And that is because we equate strength with being armed rather than with taking care of people, provisioning, having a basis for our relationships in our communities. So <laughs> in some ways we should stop using this word national security. You know, oh, absolutely. Right? Because we're falling into the trap. We're taking their language and saying, no, this is what it is. We're in the national security field, meaning guns and arms. We should, you know, right. we should call it, this is the budget for the military forces and weapons. Right. Not exactly. the national security budget. And then right. we'd be talking about what actually is. Yeah, that right? would absolutely be good. And then we could have a discussion about, well, what actually makes us secure. Right. And maybe what makes us secure is doing something about slowing down climate change that's about to leave, you know, is already leaving so many people in our country um, subject to these massive storms and so on, coastal right. erosion, all of that. We could ask what would actually make right. us secure. So people who are talking about climate change are struggling to, for, for, for politicians to see this as an issue of national security, and that's because of the language trap that we've mm -hmm. created for ourselves. Okay, you, I, I, I don't want to say became famous, but oh, it, come it, on, Joe, you, you wrote this this article in um, 1987, "Sex and Death in the Rational World of Defense Intellectuals." First of all, what a title! <laughs> Why don't you want to read this article? And and as I was reading this in preparation for the interview, I realized, wait a minute, I'd read this before. I read this in the late 80s when I was on the House Armed Services Committee staff, and you were then making your way in the, what do you call it, techno-strategic Strategic community, so yes. Where you were exposed to nuclear war planners and the way they talked about war. And I remember reading it and being struck by it because that's exactly what I was hearing from the generals and, and, and senior officials who would come up to justify the nuclear um, budget. So how does this language work in the nuclear world? Well, f first of all, let me say that I think it, there is an issue of language, but I think it's something that's even deeper than that. Uh -huh. Okay, so I think um, something that's not in that article but would give you an example of what I'm talking about is I, after I wrote that article, I had somebody from that world call me up. He was a nuclear physicist who worked on nuclear weapons. He called me up and he said, I have to talk to you. And I said, well, you know, fine, but I'm in Vermont in a little cabin. I can't talk to you now. <laughs> and he said, that's okay. I'll fly up to meet you. And he came up to talk to me and he said, I had this experience where I was uh, working with this group that was modeling all of these different kinds of counterforce attacks. And at some point somebody said, oh yeah, this one is really good. You know, it's only 30 million immediate fatalities instead of 40. And all of a sudden I heard what we were saying. I heard what we were talking about, and I said, wait, I can't believe we're talking this way. I blurted it out, and it was awful. Silence fell upon the room. I felt like a woman. <gasps> and, so, so this Does he is... Mean it, it, s sensitive and more... Se <laughs> or and, weak? And, well, he, well, he meant both. He <sighs> meant that by thinking about and feeling and letting people know that he was thinking about the people at the end of the calculations, that he was violating a central code of professional conduct in the field, 
as well as right, right, exactly. This yeah. is your point. So yeah. we talk. We, they use these 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 um, sterilized terms: limited yep. nuclear war, uh, uh, limited uh, uh, strike options, uh, usable nuclear weapons, and never talk about what actually happens when this bomb goes off. And gender is mobilized <clears throat> to keep it that way. What do you mean? That's, well, that if you know that if you talk that way, you are going to be thought of as oh, a woman, yes, yes. as a wimp, as a panty <clears throat> waist, right? Right. Then you keep your mouth shut yes. because you don't want to be delegitimized and thought less of by the other men in the room, whether you're a man or a woman, right? Because if a woman blurts out the same thing, then people just go, ugh, you know, one of these women, she can't think about this right. well. I, but if you're a man, same thing happens and to you. And you, you point out that this is not, the word that's been used a lot recently, or, or maybe for a long time on this, that's so deadly and so gendered, is realistic. Yes. Right? Yes. That you're accused of being not realistic, and this shuts you down, shuts down the conversation that might explore options other than what's being presented. Exactly. So, and this is totally gendered, because what counts as realistic is the things that we count as manly or masculine, right? What counts as realistic is believing that somebody is always out to attack you, that you have to be well defended, that you have to have a huge military, that you have to be threatening. And anything associated with, quote, the feminine, like being concerned about uh, the living conditions of your family, being or being, quote, idealistic, right? Because realism is always juxtaposed to idealism or to naivete. That anything that you want to think about, we're just back in our conversation before, if you want to think about security as something other than military might, that is considered naivete, unrealistic. Right, so arms control, unrealistic. Arms control, right. So we had this at, at the session we had at the kind of the endowment at the beginning of April, uh, we had a, a woman sp speak up about this, uh, how she was shut down at a, uh, a Brookings Institution discussion about um, uh, plans for countering Iran's missile force. And they were talking about sanctions and, and counterforce deployments and threats of military uh, force, right? And she stood up and said, well, what, wait a minute. Have you thought about maybe having an arms control regime that would, that would encompass all the countries in the region? And she was told she was being unrealistic. Yes, yeah, so first of all, and they were talking about S selling more arms, right, to other countries in the region to help counter Iran, yes, right? Yes. So having, and she was called unrealistic and naive, and this blows my mind. Because the idea, as soon as you say that, again, it stops thinking, right? You have gender coded someone, thought stops. But what is really naive or realistic in this situation? Is it to think that when we give arms or sell arms to another country that the, and that we build up arms in the region that that's going to lead to peace? Right. Is it that when we sell arms to regimes that are our, quote, friends, that those arms are not going to fall in the hands of our, quote, enemies right. shortly after, as in Iran? So. Or Saudi so, Arabia, or, with all those weapons going to Al-Qaeda-like forces that it, we gave them it, to fight Assad. Right. Exactly. But you can't have that conversation right. once, you're, once you are coded idealistic or naive. And this is amazing. The, the power of the language is amazing because this is, what, 17 years after the invasion of Iraq, 6 trillion lost, hundreds of thousands of people killed, uh, a, a region in complete disorder. I mean, we broke it so badly. And somehow, all those policies are still seen as realistic. Exactly. And those policies are being proposed against another larger, more powerful state, Iran. And somehow that's seen as strong, as tough, as realistic. So, so I, I mean, that's exactly right. And I'd argue that that's evidence that we believe in the effectiveness of these kinds of methods, not because we actually look at what happens in the world and assess how useful they are, but because we have this gendered belief system. The thing that I keep on talking about is that we overestimate the efficacy of violence and undercount its costs. And the reason that we do that is because it just feels right to us. We just grow up knowing that what strength means is violence and the ability to threaten violence. Wow. Thank you, Carol. 
Thank you so much for coming in. I recommend that everyone look up and read Sex and Death in the Rational World of Defense Intellectuals. You can also look up and find Ka Dr. Carol Cohn at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. Yes. And you can find her latest essay in online at uh, plowshares.org in the new report, A New Vision, Gender, Justice, National Security. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Joe. It's been a real pleasure. And now, 10 Minutes in the Silo, an in-depth perspective on the effects of nuclear weapons on humanity. Doomsday remains two minutes to midnight. Doomsday clock, a visual new minute mark from Esnatos. Donald Trump as US President, a Hauptgrund für führende Atomforscher, die sogenannte Doomsday clock vorzustellen. El reloj del apocalipsis, mejor conocido como Doomsday clock. Every year, the news media cycle pauses to ask two existential questions. Is the future of civilization safer or at greater risk? than it was last year? And second, is the future of civilization safer or at greater risk today compared to the more than seven decades that we've been asking the question? That's Rachel Bronson, executive director and CEO of Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. They're the folks behind the Doomsday Clock, which, since introduced in 1947, has become the universally recognized test score and metaphor for how close we are to destroying our own planet? The answers, as you may have guessed, are not good. We have entered the new abnormal. We appear to be normalizing a very dangerous world in terms of the risks of nuclear warfare and climate change. It's a state as worrisome as the most dangerous times of the Cold War. My name is Delphine Vigil. I'm the director of communications for Plasters Fund the largest U.S. foundation dedicated exclusively to nuclear policy and security. I first heard about the Doomsday Clock around 2000, when I was a journalist with the San Francisco Chronicle. In those days, back when the clock was set to nine minutes to midnight, I recall the Doomsday story being greeted in the newsroom with quaint indifference, kind of like a post-Y2K story. But now, we're officially at two minutes to midnight, the closest to the end since the height of the Cold War. Or, as former Governor Jerry Brown puts it, We're playing Russian roulette with humanity, and the danger and the probability is mounting that there will be some kind of nuclear incident that will kill millions, if not uh, initiating uh, exchanges that will kill billions. Given that threat, why aren't people more concerned? People feel very comfortable in high places, at living at the brink of total Armageddon and catastrophe. When Jerry Brown has something to say, people listen. In this case, the list includes the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Vice News, the BBC, Al Jazeera, and The Guardian, all vying for a chance to catch a quote and take the story of impending doom very seriously. In October of last year, Governor Brown decided to celebrate his retirement from nearly 50 years of public service by joining Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists as executive chair. The Bulletin Science and Security Board consists of scientists and other experts with knowledge of nuclear technology and climate science. They're the ones who set the clock's time. Plasier's Fund has been partnering with the Bulletin to raise awareness about the threats of nuclear war since the 1980s. As director of communications, I had the chance to shadow Jerry Brown as he and the Bulletin's Rachel Bronson joined Plasier's Fund Director of Policy, Tom Kalina, for a day of meetings on Capitol Hill. For this podcast, I'd like to take you behind the scenes. But first, two minutes to midnight. What does that mean? For Defense Secretary Bill Perry, it invokes memories of 1953, the last time the clock was set at 11.58 p.m. The Soviet Union had just tested a hydrogen bomb. The brutal Korean War was still going on, already having claimed millions of lives. The U.S. forces in Germany were outnumbered three to one by the Red Army and fully expected the Red Army to attack them. And they were authorized and prepared to use tactical nuclear weapons to stop that advance. But the nuclear dangers are not because we expect 
an attack from Russia. The danger is that we will blunder into a nuclear war. Emphasizing issues such as human error, cyber attacks, the moral factor, and an importance for public dialogue, Secretary Perry joined Governor Brown, along with former Senator Sam Nunn of Georgia, for a day of nuclear policy meetings on Capitol Hill. The schedule included in-depth discussions with Washington State Congressman Adam Smith, who is the new chair of the House Armed Services Committee, as well as Massachusetts Senator Ed Markey, both of whom are working on no first-use legislation. Plowshares also met for over an hour with Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi and Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer. All of this was co-organized by the Bulletin and Plowshares Fund Director of Policy, Tom Kalina. Congressman Smith was was able to uh, define for us what his key agenda items were, uh, which is canceling Trump's uh, new nuclear weapon, declaring a no first use policy, and saving arms control from uh, Trump's effort to, to kill it. And I think we, particularly uh, Bill Perry and Governor Brown, were able to, to reinforce for Congressman Smith that in fact, yeah, we, you know, we agree with your priorities. Um, and we've got your back. Shadowing Governor Jerry Brown and Secretary Perry for meetings about nuclear policy in Washington is like watching Jedi Master Yoda and Obi-Wan Kenobi discuss the dark side of the Force in Episode One of Star Wars. I was very much Jar Jar Binks, with my recorder trying not to spill coffee on anyone, and I guess that would make Tom see 3 po as he is fluent in more than six million forms of legislative languages. The congressional office buildings are as ornate as they are intimidating. Wow, this building is incredible. I think this way. Yeah, I recognize Ben Franklin. And if I'm not mistaken, Walter Mondale's on the right. Not so much for Governor Brown and Secretary Perry, though, who remain laser-focused, despite taking time to pose for selfies and make small talk with passing constituents and sitting senators. At one point, Governor Brown used the force to more productively accelerate a meeting time with Senator Ed Markey. To the Dirksen building, Senate building, where... Um, Is that where uh, Markey they, they could accelerate from Markey. Well, I could try. It's unlikely. Why? Well, because well, they pack their schedules up every minute. They do? Please. Going up. Well, this, this, was, this was when I realized I was, uh, that Jerry Brown was in a different league. We, we wanted to, tr- we wanted to uh, change the time of our meeting with um, uh, Senator Markey. And, and my, my approach to that is to call the scheduler, uh, who I, of course, couldn't reach. And uh, Governor Brown's response was to call Senator Markey's private cell phone. <laughs> and he got the meeting changed. So what time do you move Ten minutes. We don't Ten want to, I don't know how far it is from here, but uh, we got to let Tom know. We're done. Okay, we'll meet us in 10 minutes. <laughs> I, was just talking, I just left you messing with the schedule. I talked to him personally. Tell you why we wanted to have we'll some there. Governor Brown with some That's what. Excellent. So what did he say? I'll see him in, t- see me in 10 minutes. He's going to leave you the meeting. Well, then we should go now if we're going to see him. How far does it take? <laughs> take 10 minutes to get there? The longest meeting of the day was in the office of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. She gave plowshares in the bulletin more than an hour of her time. Joining the conversation at Pelosi's packed conference table included Minority Leader Chuck Schumer and the ranking leaders of several committees. An oil painting of Abraham Lincoln with a nearby taxidermy bald eagle stared down at us all. Surely, in 2019, there could be no more suitable place to discuss ideas for saving the world from nuclear annihilation than right here. We weren't allowed to record the conversation, so I asked Senator Sam Nunn to share his key takeaways immediately following the discussion. These days, he serves as co-chair of NTI, the Nuclear Threat Initiative. As Reagan and Gorbachev later said that a nuclear war cannot be won, it must not be fought. But I have worried for many years, and I must say I'm more concerned now than I've ever been, even during the Soviet-U.S.-NATO confrontation in the 80s and 70s. I'm more worried about a blunder, an accident, a miscalculation, an atmosphere which we're now developing very rapidly of total mistrust between the two countries that have 90% of the nuclear weapons, Mm -hmm. combined with some type of accident, some type of uh, flare-up, something goes wrong, things go wrong, Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden the guy that's on the warning system and the guy in the silo uh, with the nuclear weapons uh, send an order up 
or at least the notice that we're being attacked, even though it might be a cyber interference, it might be a fake warning. It's not only a security obligation, it's an ethical and moral obligation to our children and our grandchildren, and not just to our countries, but to the whole world. The bulletin's Rachel Bronson recently shared her thoughts as well. So the opportunity to get into that office and, and take the time, take take the time that that was allotted, and focus on the state of uh, nuclear security and what might be possible to to create a more secure world. Those are the things that we started talking about. What are the options? And it was really a brainstorming meeting to some extent, but you had key people in the room who could make a difference. And I think there was a general sense that having that meeting showed that the, that, uh, the House leadership was focusing increasingly on the risk of nuclear weapons. Governor Brown's blunt tone was no different when he spoke with the media than when he did with Pelosi and Schumer, or the coffee barista for that matter. For Jerry Brown, the doomsday clock offers dialogue as a path forward. I will spend the next few years doing everything I can to sound the alarm and get us back on a track of dialogue, collaboration, and arms control. So yes, whether you're a Democrat or Republican or somewhere in between, we need to have dialogue. And the only path forward is dialogue dialogue about the most important threat facing humanity. The Doomsday Clock is on display and can be visited at the University of Chicago. For more information, visit thebulletin.org. That's our show. Thank you very much for joining us, and please come back next week where we are going to have an extended interview with Ned Price, a former top official in the Obama administration and now one of the leaders of National Security Action. See you then. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced by Delphine Vigil and Megan McCall. Audio engineering by Derek Zender. Theme music is by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.